The next step is to go away from the thermodynamics of cells and let's talk about the physics of cell potentials. Okay. Whenever we have a, a given phase, a given conducting phase, we can think about that phase as being isolated by itself sitting in a vacuum. And we can ask ourselves, what's the potential of that phase? Where, what, how can we think about the, poten the potential of that phase? Well, the definition of a, that potential of that phase is as follows. The potential will be given a symbol, phi, and that's often called the inner potential. And that potential is in volts. And volts has units of joules per coulomb in the SI system. And the inner potential is, as you might guess, is the potential that you would measure inside a uniform phase, uh, at the, in the inner, inside a uniform phase of material. And the way it's calculated in theory is to think of some phase, let's call it phase alpha, and think about a test massless charge starting from infinity and bringing that test charge into the inside of our, our phase and calculating the work required to move that test charge from infinity into the phase. And so at the limit uh, from as the test charge approaches zero in charge, it's the work versus charge, and that's going to be our inner potential of species of phase alpha. And according to electrostatics theory, it really doesn't matter about the path that charge takes. It's a, the, uh, it can take any particular path as long as it gets to the inside of our phase. Now, it's, it's really not possible to measure the inner potential in this way. First of all, we don't have massless test charges that we can calculate the work required to bring them into, inside our phase. It's also impossible to completely isolate a piece of matter and to do that thing. There's always some interfering potential fields that will cause the inner potential to be not what we think it is. Um, so that might be an electrostatic effect or we might have a, a redox effect to think about with our inner phase. But we can, in principle, think about a, a conductor having a, an inner potential. The other thing we know about the inner potential, so for any uniform phase that has a, fit, a composition that's this uniform and, uh, and it's not, and it's solid or it's, it's one mass, it doesn't have any voids or anything in it. We, what do we, else do we know about it? Well, we know that if we think about the phase, the potential, say, here or here or here, that those three inner potentials have to be the same. In other words, we can't have inside our conducting phase different values of the inner potential. Now that should be, after a little bit of reflection, that should be obvious to you why that is. If we had a difference in potential, because it's a conductor, current would flow immediately to minimize that potential. So by Ohm's law, the current would flow and then as soon as current flows, those potentials would equalize immediately. And so as long as we've got a conductor, we don't have any variations in the inner potential. So inside, at all points, phi is identical. <laughs>
The other thing about the inner potential is that it suggests that according to uh, uh, what theory first proposed by a guy named Gauss, that the charge that provides the inner potential resides on the surface. How, can, how do we know that? Well, let's think about our little phase again. And let's think about any particular closed path on that uh, thing. If there was any particular closed path, we could actually consider the fact that if there was a different amount of charge distribution inside along that path, that there would actually be a potential along that path and current would flow to minimize the potential. So since there is infinitely many paths that we can draw, and any path that we draw, the current would flow to be minimized, it suggests that there is, in fact, no potential along any closed path inside our phase. And the only way that can work out is that if the charge all rely, resides on the surface. So um, the charge resides on the surface. So Q sub, in this case, alpha, rely, resides on the surface. So if we have a hunk of metal and it has a potential associated with it, and it has a charge on the, that piece of metal, that charge exists on the surface of the metal. Let's see. Okay. And that's an important point. So what if we put in our phase alpha with its charge in the, on the, on the uh, surface, there's an, an, an analogy to this in, um, in a, another physics field of, of gravitation. If you take any spherical solid body, the gravitational field inside would be zero, somewhat similar to the, to the um, idea of, a, of this charge being existing on the surface. And it all exists on the surface, so the, the question you might ask yourself is, if the charge exists on the surface, how thick is that layer of charge on the surface? Well, it turns out for metal, that charge layer is quite thin, a, a few less than an angstrom in thickness, in fact, sub-angstrom in thickness. So even if you're just a little bit inside the surface of the metal, the, the charge is quite thin. Now, if you put that metal particle or metal electrode into a solution, the charge exists on the surface of that, and then there's also going to be, quickly, because we, as we've talked about before, there will be a charge on the solution around it. And remember we said that Q sub M is equal to minus Q sub S uh, before. And what if we enclose our our uh, metal and a, solution, and a volume of solution just around the metal with our path again. Well, again, because of the requirements that for any conducting phase have a zero uh, net charge inside it, we're going to have expect that any path that we draw around it enclosing that metal particle in the solution just around it also has zero. And so in order for that to be true, we have to have this be true. Q sub m is equal to minus. Q sub S. And what about the surface of our solution? Well, our entire uh, solute now is going to have a charge of Q sub M on it because at some point the charge will exist on the surface of our solvent and that will be minus Q sub M. Now, for a metal electrode, the charge on the metal electrode can cause it to have a high potential, uh, 
but if that's existing in a fairly large uh, bit of solution, the charge in the solution can be less because that charge can be spread out over, uh, 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 the voltage and the potential of the solution can be less because it'll spread out over a large area. Okay. So as we said, we can't really measure the uh, potential of our, inner potential of our material, but we can, we can uh, think about it appropriately. And so that's unmeasurable. What's also unmeasurable are systems like this. For example, suppose we have a metal in contact with solution. And so we can think about the potential of the zinc and the potential of the solution. It turns out that we can't measure the difference between the zinc and the solution. You can't measure that potential difference. Why is that? Because as soon as we tried to measure that potential, we'd have to put our probe to measure that potential difference somewhere else. So in other words, we would have to say measure versus the zinc wire, and then to, to measure the solution potential, we'd have to put in another interface of some, of some metal. And so that also, that interface is also unmeasurable. So we can't measure that in, in, uh, by itself. So in general, any difference in two phases, the absolute difference in two phases, say alpha and beta, is unmeasurable. But so what is measurable in our systems? Well, if we take a system like this where we have a copper voltmeter lead connected to our zinc electrode uh, in solution with some chloride ions and silver chloride and a copper wire there, we could in fact measure that voltage in the system. So that would be an inter we could we could uh, we could think about measuring that potential. Now that doesn't give us uh, the interfacial potential. In fact, it doesn't give us that potential. In fact, there's a large number of um, interfacial potentials that we can consider in this particular case. What we've measured in this case is this potential difference. The difference between the copper one copper on one side and the copper prime on the other side. So the ultimate source of the potential is the presence of excess charge, okay, and that excess charge is at the interface. Just to give us some idea about charge, a coulomb of charge is six times 10 to the 18th electrons. And that's an awful lot of charge, actually. Of course, a microcoulomb would be less, six times 10 to the 12th electrons. And uh, current is the movement of charge. And so when we talk about an ampere, that's one coulomb per second. And that's six times 10 to the 18th electrons per second. And often in electrochemistry, we'll talk about measuring Currents as small as a picoamp, and so now we're talking about the movement of fairly small amounts of small numbers of electrons, six times ten to the six electrons per second. And the magnitude of charge required to change the potential of an interface is quite small. Uh, if we take a sphere of, of a particular metal and put it in a vacuum or a, an isolated system, and we start adding electrons to it. How many electrons would it take to change the potential of that metal by, say, a volt? Well, suppose we put a, uh, a mercury sphere 
0.5 millimeters in diameter in vacuum. It actually requires um, about 5 times 10 to the minus 14th coulombs to raise the potential by 1 volt. And that number of coulombs happens to be about 30,000 electrons. So <clears throat> just a fraction of a second of a picoamp level of current will change that potential of that isolated sphere by uh, one volt. And so you can see it doesn't take very many electrons whatsoever to do that particular job. Now how do we get this excess charge in our phase? That's the, that's the next question we might want to ask ourselves. We could probably have better, better to say it on a phase rather than in a phase. Uh, first of all, we can think about um, charges that arise due to the electronic properties of the material. For example, semiconductors, particularly like say silicon that's doped with uh, materials like gallium or uh, arsenic, will have an excess number of electrons or holes depending on the uh, what it's doped with. So you can think of in the lattice of silicon, you can put in a, um, say, a arsenic to replace a silicon. And of course, there's a lattice of all those other silicons associated with it. And that adds basically a little bit of a positive charge in that system. So here we have a, a charge that's built into the semiconductor system. And so that charge, being free to move around, now is. Um, is, uh, makes it a conductor and that system would be charged. The second idea, we can have ions at the interface so if we put in a uh, piece of platinum electrode, it turns out that chloride because of its chemical properties will adsorb to the platinum electrode and so the adsorption of the platinum or the chloride ions at the platinum electrode causes the uh, charge to then be built up in the platinum to compensate for that. We can't have that charge at the interface without a corresponding charge at the platinum electrode to, to balance it out. Third source would be an electrostatic field. If we put a bit of matter in a large field of electricity, then there will be a charge, there will be a potential inside that material. We usually don't worry about those sorts of things in electrochemistry because the solution that we put it in tends to dampen the strength of an external ele uh, electric field. The fourth one, though, that we do worry about is um, dipoles at interfaces. And here's a system where we can have a charge buildup that is really due to a fractional amount of charge from interfacial species. Again, if we put a, say, a platinum electrode in water, not only if we just put it in water, it turns out that the dipoles will orient themselves, uh, the water dipoles will orient, it, orient it themselves on the surface. And so the dipoles being absorbed on there will now uh, cause a charge to build up on the platinum electrode. And this would be the case for almost any type of electrode. You'd have this ion adsorption, or if there's no ions like chloride in the solution, you can also have dipole adsorption and, and both at the same time, in fact. All right. Okay.